Jean Schnupp here. Welcome to another Savvy Sightseer video vacation. This program is one part of a two-segment visit to Spain. When I booked with a group tour to Spain, it was for the end of February. A great time, I figured, to escape to sunshine and 60 degree Fahrenheit temperatures. Little did I know it would be my last European trip for the foreseeable future. Given that I arrived back on March 1st, 2020, just before the COVID-19 pandemic really got underway, I now count this as one of my most memorable trips. Normally, I don't like coach tours, but it just made sense given the amount of territory that could be covered as we traveled through the Iberian Peninsula, the extreme southwest part of Europe that Spain shares with its smaller neighbor, Portugal. Several times we stayed more than one night in a hotel, so it wasn't as exhausting as tours where you move all of your belongings each morning at the crack of dawn. When I watch this program, I am amazed at just how much I got to see and do. We started in the country's capital, Madrid, then moved south and west through La Mancha territory to Cordoba and Seville, or Sevilla, before heading off to Granada and Valencia, and then winding down in Barcelona, or Barcelona, on the Mediterranean coast. Equally impressive is how much history and culture varied with each town, not to mention their mouth-watering dishes, like a chicken paella I made at a cooking school. Unfortunately, there's only so much that can fit into a program, so I decided to split this destination to give you a richer experience, rather than cut each city's offering to the bare bones. Still, each is so jam-packed, you will need to buckle up for this whirlwind tour of southwest Spain and the beautiful cities of Madrid, Cordoba, and Seville. I apologize in advance for any pronunciation mishaps. Whenever feasible or practical, I put the Spanish name on the slides to sort of minimize any damage I might do to the language. Remember, the pictures and stories you'll see and hear on this program are only the tip of the iceberg. Many more beautiful scenes are posted to my website. Well, like the Spanish explorers who sailed to the Americas, it's Americans turn to explore their country. Cinderella may have had a crystal glass slipper, but Madrid has a crystal palace. A highlight of the city's counterpart to our Central Park, their Park Retiro, is the stunning Palacio de Cristal. Erected in 1887, the pavilion was based on the Crystal Palace built in London for the Great Exhibition in 1851. This one was designed specifically, though, to showcase tropical plants for the Philippines Exposition of 1887. Intricate ceramics weave around the palace's ironwork, creating a magnificent birdcage aesthetic. At its highest point, atop the majestic domed roof, is its cupola, 72 feet up. Today, the palace is used almost exclusively as a venue for special art exhibits. In 2020, the main show was called The Keys to the Kingdom and was created by musician and plastic artist Hassan Khan, who used songs, flags, glass sculptures, digital murals, and other media to provoke questions, he said, about today's political environments. The Crystal Palace is just one of the attractions at the 308-acre Park Retiro, whose name translates to Park of the Pleasant Retreat. In addition to this tranquil stream, it also features a man-made lake, an amusement park, and a wild animal zoo. It's an ideal place to relax and unwind from a long day of touring. There's over 15,000 trees and countless varieties of animal species and plants, including a Mexican conifer that is nearly 400 years old. It's believed to be Madrid's oldest tree. But in season, a special highlight is an enormous rose garden with more than 4,000 roses blooming from May to June. To admire blooms at any time of the year, step into the adjacent, of all places, train station. The Atacha was Madrid's first train station and had a very humble beginning in 1851 as a simple stopping point with a wooden platform. 
A train shed wasn't even added until 1892. It became the capital's largest station, serving millions of passengers each year. In 1992, a new station was added across from it to accommodate a modern high-speed rail terminal, and the original station's tracks were removed. It then underwent a very unique evolution into a lovely tropical garden. Beyond the agent checking his manifest for perhaps the last train in, an indoor botanical oasis now flourishes. 400 different species are in bloom, and there are over 7,000 plants and trees from as far away as the islands of the Indian Ocean. Until recently, there was even a pool for turtles who were abandoned by their owners and then rescued from Madrid's waterways. They've since been relocated to a nearby wildlife park due to overcrowding and overpopulation of the ponds. Two bronze sculptures outside the stations depict the passage of time. Both are modeled after the artist's granddaughter. This one is her daytime alert look. Across the plaza from day is night, a matching 4,400 pound, 10 foot tall head of the girl sleeping. The figures face east and west, symbolizing morning and evening, or a journey from beginning to end, a fitting addition to a train station. Back in the park is another unusual sculpture one devoted to the Prince of Darkness. Madrid has one of the few monuments in the world dedicated to the devil. Sculpted by a Spanish artist for the Paris World Fair in 1878, it was subsequently acquired by the Madrid City Council. The aptly named Fallen Angel, curiously enough, sits at 666 meters above sea level. A more standard tribute to royalty, is this monument to Alfonso XII, a tribute to a very popular monarch who ruled from 1874 to 1885. It's one of the most visited places in the park. In 1902, a national contest was held to design a monument for the ruler who had been dubbed the Peacemaker. The winning design was a semicircular 282 foot long colonnade surrounding a tower on which an equestrian statue of the emperor rises more than 98 feet. During his reign as King of Spain, Alfonso consolidated the monarchy and government institutions were stabilized. At his feet, there are statues embodying peace, freedom, and progress. More than 20 sculptors worked on the colonnade, coats of arms of different Spanish provinces, as well as scenes of typical professions of the region adorn the semicircle. A pride of lions guard the statue above steps leading down to a lake. In addition to representing the Spanish kingdom of Leon, the lion is a popular symbol of royalty and is typically associated with majesty, strength, courage, justice, and military might. They are also powerfully portrayed at a nearby square. Called the Sibelis Fountain, it is one of the city's most famous landmarks and one of its grandest sculptures at 26 feet tall and 105 feet in diameter. It was built in 1782 under the orders of King Carlos III and depicts Sibeli, the great mother of the gods and Roman goddess of fertility. She commands a chariot drawn by two lions. In her hands, she holds a scepter and the keys to the city. It is decorative, but has also been functional once providing water for the official water carriers who would deliver it to the houses, as well as for the general public. And it was even used by the cavalry as a water stop for their horses. And for something completely different, we find the city's unofficial mascot, the bear and the berry tree, a statue in Madrid's Puerta del Sol, a gateway square and popular meeting point in the old town. Its name is mistakenly translated to specify a strawberry tree, but while the tree's fruit has a similar look to the strawberry, it is an entirely different type of berry that is plentiful in the area. Locals consider him a talisman and rub his tail or paw for luck, leaving behind shiny spots on his black coat. Of course, the most impressive structure in Madrid is the Royal Palace. It is huge the largest in Western Europe by floor space, nearly one and a half million square feet, 
That's roughly double the size of Buckingham Palace. It has more than 3,000 rooms, 870 windows, 240 balconies, and 44 staircases. And oddly enough, 150 clocks. It was the vision of 18th century King Philip V to replicate the place where he was born in Versailles at the French home of his grandfather, King Louis XIV. It took 17 years to replace an earlier fortress on the spot and create this mammoth showcase. Today, current King Philippi VI uses the castle only for state occasions, choosing to live in a more modest palace just outside of Madrid. Designed by Francesco Sabatini, the elaborate entryway has 70 steps, each one made from a single piece of St. Augustine marble. The ceiling fresco depicts the triumph of the religion and the church, protected by the Spanish monarchy. The Hall of Columns is an historic venue in the building. In this room is where a treaty was signed formally admitting Spain to the European Union in 1985. It is also where King Juan Carlos I, once a popular leader, but eventually plagued by scandal and poor judgments, abdicated his rule to his son in 2014, right under the statue of Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. A requisite of every ruling palace is the throne room, and to say Spain's one is elaborate would be a gross understatement. It is decorated with 18th century decor, huge mirrors, walls of rich, deep red velvet, and silver. Twin thrones are guarded by, no surprise, bronze lions, which are also on the coat of arms. Certainly the venue is sufficiently grand for the ruler of an empire that at one time spanned both hemispheres. Completely opposite in style is the porcelain room, where the walls and ceiling are completely covered in porcelain, because really, who doesn't need this in their home? A fascination with this type of ceramics began in the 18th century through trade with the Far East. Another room contains the world's largest collection of five-stringed instruments by Antonio Stradivari, and the Palace Library boasts a first edition of Cervantes' Don Quixote. Then there's the dining room with a seemingly endless table. Lavish royal receptions are still held here, and the dinner list could tally up to 150 guests at a time. Not what I'd call intimate dining, but which leads me to my must-see space in the palace. The kitchens, reopened in October 2017 after a major renovation, the palaces are considered among the oldest, best-preserved kitchens of a European royal residence. They are certainly notable for their size, 8,600 square feet. Two large coal-fired stoves connected to hot cupboards date from the reign of Isabel II in the mid-19th century. Atop this stove is a huge pan called a paella. Many people mistakenly define the word paella as the internationally known rice dish from Spain, but it's not. The word is actually the name of the pan that the rice dish is cooked in. It originated in the fields of a region called Valencia on the country's eastern coast, which is featured in my Southeastern Spain program. Farm workers would gather for a communal midday meal. Since there were no big trees on the farm, they relied on smaller sticks to build a fire. It wasn't as hot though as a large wood fire, so they used a pan that was wider to heat evenly and faster for a simple rice dish using whatever ingredients were readily available. Unlike today, original paella didn't include shellfish. Each worker had his own spoon, and they all ate directly from the pan. Today, the dish paella is made in every region of Spain, using just about any ingredient that goes well with rice. There are as many versions of paella as there are cooks. It may contain chicken, pork, shellfish, eel, squid, beans, peas, artichokes, or peppers. Saffron, the spice that also turns the rice a wonderful golden color, is, however, an essential part of the dish everywhere. I had a hand in making this modern version of chicken paella at a cooking class in Triana, Seville. I can tell you, it was delicious, but I digress. 
back to the royal kitchens, a variety of tools of the trade are needed to create elegant royal dining experiences. Here, rooms are full of molds, piping, and decoration tools for imperial-worthy chocolates, desserts, and pastry that would grace royal tables at banquets then and now. Alfonso XIII introduced an extraordinary collection of French-made copper pots and pans in the early 20th century. They were coated inside in silver to protect diners from potential poisoning. A veritable army of cooks would bustle around this enormous room from morning into night. Two kitchen boys were kept on duty through the night to make sure that the burners were never extinguished. One place royal chefs may have gotten their goods over the years is at the nearby food market. With a classy iron and glass building, the over 100-year-old Mercado de San Miguel is elevated to much more than a simple covered food market. Fresh ingredients are brought in each day from all over Spain, offering Madrid shoppers access to a wide variety of regional flavors, and it's considered a culinary cultural center. In 2000, it was declared a property of cultural interest. Some go so far as to call it a gastronomic temple, with 33 vendors selling food such as fish, meat, pasta, tapas, beer, cocktails, etc. Additionally, there are also a few cafes, bars, and many restaurants offering specialty foods and drink. Venturing south from Madrid to our next stop at Cordova, we pass through the countryside known as La Mancha. It is a term familiar to most and prompts thoughts of the flawed Cervantes character of Don Quixote. In the 17th century novel, a questionably delusional Quixote roams the central plains region of La Mancha in search of great adventures as an anachronistic medieval knight. Along the way, he mistakes windmills, like the three-story chunky white ones here in the town of Consuegra, as giant human adversaries, and he rages against them. His name added a word to our vocabulary, quixotic, meaning exceedingly idealistic, unrealistic, and impractical. Windmills are still prominent throughout the Spanish countryside, though not like those three-story chunky white ones we just saw that we used to mill flour. Now, sleek 328-foot-tall wind turbines don't grind grain, but rather generate energy. Spain ranks fifth in the world for wind power production, much of which comes from the La Mancha region. At one time, Cordoba, about four hours south of Madrid, was the world's largest city, counting about one million residents. It was founded by the Romans as a port city of great importance, used for shipping Spanish olive oil, wine, and wheat back to ancient Rome. But today, it is better known for what happens there in the spring. Each May, the town holds a two-week festival and competition for who has the most beautiful patio. From Roman to modern times, the town's enclosed patios or courtyards have offered welcome relief from heat building up indoors. They are essentially outdoor living rooms that have evolved over time to be quite elaborate with ornate ironwork grills, colorful and fragrant flowers, fountains, and even birds. Usually these are for the enjoyment only of the homeowner and guests, but during the festival, about 50 are open to the public. Not really prepared for what I'd find behind that white stucco and little arched doorway. I was fascinated with this home architectural style found all over Spain, an open air courtyard completely enclosed within a house's walls and generally invisible from the street. The Festival of the Patios, which started in 1918, is such a unique feature of the town that UNESCO added it to its list of intangible cultural heritage of humanity sites. Imagine this courtyard in two months from my visit when all new blooms have filled the pots. And keep in mind, it's invisible from the street. Cordoba's hour of greatest glory was when it became the capital of a Moorish kingdom. In 711, the Moors arrived and in time built the largest mosque in the world at about 260,000 square feet. 
the great mosque or mesquita became the center of Western Islam. Before entering the mosque, the faithful would wash in fountain pools in this courtyard. The first emir was homesick and had ordered palm trees to be planted. However, these orange trees are not original to the open space, but were planted in place of some palms in the 13th century. Although this appears wide open to the public, it is still within the walls of the mosque. At its largest, the mosque's prayer room had over 1,000 columns made of marble, granite, jasper, and onyx. About one-third were removed when the city was reconquered by Christian King Ferdinand III in 1236 to make room for a cathedral. The new rulers of the city were so awed by the mosque's beauty that they left most of it standing. About 850 arched columns remain around the cathedral, which pokes through the original mosque roof, creating an extraordinary new melding of culture with the church mosque we see today. This artist's rendition gives a bird's eye view of the mosque at its largest. You can see about one third of the total area, roughly 600 by 427 feet, was just for the courtyard, which was within the walls of the mosque complex. Look at how the addition of the cathedral truly altered the footprint of this structure. The Christians also got creative with the mosque's minaret, converting it to a bell tower. Orange trees are plentiful in Cordoba. Their fruit may look inviting, but they are a little bitter and so largely used for ornamental purposes, unlike the much sweeter ones Valencia is known for. Seville is one of Spain's largest cities. It was considered a gateway to the New World and an important harbor during the Spanish conquest of the American continent. Explorers Christopher Columbus, Amerigo Vespucci, and Ferdinand Magellan sailed from its great river harbor, discovering the abundant sources of gold, silver, cocoa, and tobacco. These New World riches turned Seville into Spain's largest and wealthiest city. This gold tower was the point from which Magellan set sail in the early 1500s for the first circumnavigation of the earth. During the invasion of the Americas, it is said that the tower was used to house gold plundered from the Mayans and Incas. Today, Seville is the capital of Spain's southern region called Andalusia. Seville has the largest, oldest, and most important arena for bullfighting in Spain. It has a seating capacity of over 12,000. There are strong feelings both pro and anti bullfighting, and whether you view it as a sport, an art form, or just plain barbaric, the Maestranza is one of Seville's most popular venues. Bullfighting reportedly traces its roots to the early 8th century and is possibly a descendant of the Roman gladiator games. Due to financial and cultural conflicts, Seville's arena took 120 years to complete after it began in 1761. Throughout the country, most of the old bull rings have now been repurposed to such uses as shopping malls. Adding to the claims to having the biggest, here you will also find Casa di Pilatos, built between the 15th and 16th centuries. It's one of the biggest private residences of Seville. Now I'm looking at this and asking, what has this got to do with Pilates? It is a bit big for a gym, don't you think? Turns out it was not named for the German Joseph Pilates, who invented a popular workouts regime, but rather for Pontius Pilate, who ordered the crucifixion of Christ. The house was commissioned by a nobleman to resemble Pontius Pilate's home in Jerusalem, which had impressed him on a world tour. Again, note, these doors could close out the public and the huge open air courtyard would be blocked from view, completely contained within the house's walls. Like I said, fascinating. This courtyard's central fountain provides cooling water and is topped with the image of Janus, whose back-to-back -back heads see both past and future. In each corner, statues pay tribute to Roman figures, including Minerva, the goddess of wisdom and strategic war, as well as Ceres, goddess of harvest and agriculture. Casa di Pilatos not only has this large courtyard, or patio principal, it has two more open areas within its complex. 
In summer, bedrooms flanked the central square. The flowing fountain just outside contributed to cooling the ground floor, one more way to beat the heat. In winter, residents moved to the second floor for sleeping. The house is recognized for many of its features. A coffered ceiling carved with the coats of arms of the families of the palace, dating back to 1483. It also has the largest and considered the finest collection of Spanish tiles, as well as some wood ceilings made from Lebanon cedar that is disease resistant and so never needs repair. And there's a choice of gardens, large or small, depending on your mood of the day. Statuary is more prominent in the smaller one, while color and diverse greenery dominate the larger one. Geraniums provide not only a splash of color, but also protection from mosquitoes who shy away from the fragrant plants. Rounding out the list of Seville's extremes are the mushrooms, also known as Metropole Parasol, or Las Cestas, which is Spanish for mushrooms. The 500 by 230 foot undulating structure certainly fulfilled the criteria of a contest to rework a town square to demonstrate Seville's, quote, role as one of the world's most fascinating cultural destinations. German architect J. Mayer H., a Princeton alum, won the competition in 2004 to design the innovative four-story structure. The complex includes an underground archeological site of Roman ruins, above which are a farmer's market, shops, bars, and restaurants. But the star feature is the terrace level, high above at about 85 feet, with fabulous views of the city. Originally budgeted at 50 million euro, the world's largest wooden structure ran over cost by nearly double by the time it was finished in 2011. Laminated timber and steel form waffle-like canopies, like parasols, with walkways underneath. The architect says he was inspired by an image of neighboring ficus trees and says the parasols grow out of the underground excavation site into a contemporary landmark, firmly bridging the city's past with its future. Another intended effect, he said, was to create a sort of cathedral without walls. Mayer says he chose wood as the ultimate environmentally friendly material. It's renewable, avoids greenhouse emissions, and locks in carbon. Not everyone appreciates his aesthetic vision, though. And like the Eiffel Tower in Paris, the mushrooms are a love-it-or-hate-it venue by locals. To compare it with a real ficus, a nearby square is a great spot to take a shade break under the mammoth tree in nearby Maria Luisa Park. Originally a private green space for royals, the 84-acre park was gifted to the city by the Infanta Maria Luisa in May of 1893. By the way, an Infanta is a daughter of the ruling monarch of Spain or Portugal, especially the eldest daughter, who is not heir to the throne. Dotted throughout the park are impressive sculptures, Seated in her garden domain, the park's namesake, Maria Luisa Fernanda, is immortalized in bronze. If you hit it lucky, you may come upon some live entertainment in the park, listed by UNESCO as an intangible cultural heritage in 2010, the de facto national dance of Spain has its roots in Seville. It is a form of song, dance, and music, mostly guitar, commonly associated with the Andalusian Roma, or gypsies of the region. Migrants from India brought with them musical instruments such as tambourines, bells, and wooden castanets. And they embraced the Sephardic Jewish and Moorish cultures already there. The cultural intermingling produced the unique art form known as flamenco. The dance and music are expressions of their lives and struggles, sadness or joy, sensuous laments. <laughs> certainly embodies a lot of energy in that. Also, relating to the sensuous laments is this dramatic multifaceted sculpture. Next to the marble bust of Spanish romantic po poet Gustavo Becker, three women sit below Cupid. They relate the stages of romance from left to right, lost love, hopeful love, 
and possess love. On the other side of the poet is a bronzed, hurt love, represented by a fallen angel with his wings broken and a dagger stuck in his torso. A grand showpiece of the park is the Plaza de España, bordered by a massive, nearly 600-foot-long, semicircular brick building. It's said to offer an embrace for all who visit. If the building looks familiar, that's because the plaza was featured prominently as a locale in a galaxy far, far away. That would be Star Wars, Attack of the Clones. Stars Anakin and Padme stroll across the square under the porticos. It was also a backdrop for Lawrence of Arabia. The plaza was built for the Ibero-American Exhibition of 1929, an event to promote relationships between Spain, Latin America, the U.S., Portugal, and Brazil. The building is surrounded by 48 small pavilions, each dedicated to a province of Spain and decorated in intricately illustrated ceramic tiles that demonstrate the city's industrial and craft capabilities. Here, yet again, Cervantes' poor fabled character rails at the windmills of Spain's La Mancha region, believing them still to be giants he needed to vanquish. Running through the 12-acre complex is a canal crossed by four elegantly curved bridges, each relating to the ancient Spanish kingdoms of Castile, Navarre, Aragon, and Leon. Colorful tiles and artwork give the architecture an exquisitely delicate look. Up close, you can see the enormous amount of detailed handiwork incorporated in the local tile. Seville is recognized as the center of this art form. Ceramic tiles called azuleos, from the Arabic word for little stone, are painted and glazed tiles used to decorate every surface, including the undersides of balconies and walls of houses, as you saw at the plaza and in Casa Pilatos. The center of the ceramics industry since Roman days had been in the Seville neighborhood of Triana, where there's easy access to the rich clay of the Guadalquivir River. In Moorish times, the arts of painting and glazing tiles really got going. Prohibited from depicting living things, it was the Moors who created the abstract geometric designs that are still common today. Triana's history of pottery tradition is explored at this museum, located in a ceramics factory that was started in the late medieval era. Whole generations of masters, molders, painters, etc., produced countless vases and tiles that won Triana tile world fame. Artisans are still turning out beautiful tiles and ceramics, carrying on a long tradition of craftsmanship. Although by no means the largest of Seville's buildings, this one really caught my attention. On the very edge of a super busy convergence of roadways is the Queen's Sewing Box, a small hexagonal castle with turrets and horizontal striping of red and white. Built late in the 19th century, it really stands out at the ultra-modern crossroad with so many vehicles whizzing by that it was hard to get a clear picture. A popular legend holds that it was being constructed as a retreat for a queen to do her sewing and such in peace. However, always in poor health, she reportedly died of typhus before it was built. The fanciful name and story, though, live on. Today, it's a tourist information office and meeting center for local government officials. I like to end all of my programs with the words of Dr. Seuss. Sometimes you don't appreciate the moment until it becomes a memory. And I like to add to that to always remember to celebrate the moments and treasure the memories. I hope you've enjoyed your journey around this section of Spain. If you have any questions about the program, email me or use the contact page on my website. There's so much more of Spain on my website, which is also where you can visit any of my other European destinations. And it's where you can check my programs tab to see where I'll be presenting either virtually or in person. Be sure to keep an eye out for the other half of the Spain program covering the southeastern area, taking a closer look at Granada, Valencia, and Barcelona. Till the next time, adios.